people. <clears throat> Tell you people that I left Oklahoma City quite early that Friday morning with reservations from Oklahoma City to Chicago, then Chicago to Washington, and then Washington to Roanoke, which was my final destination. <clears throat> Everything went well in, in Chicago. The weather was bad, and we were late leaving Chicago, which caused us to be late getting into Washington. So as a result of that, I was put on standby for flight 349, as I had missed my flight to Roanoke. I was at the gate along with other people waiting to see if we could get aboard, and the flight attendant checked different tickets as well as my own. And he said, then he said he had one seat available, and, and he, after he looked at the tickets a second time, he said, all right, Mr. Bradley, get aboard. So I was the last one to get on that flight. And the <clears throat> only seat available was a single seat in the right rear. And I think about this point every day. I've already thought about today several times, I think because of this, th this morning. And that is this. Suppose somebody else was already in that right seat, right back seat. Would I then, <clears throat> I would have had to take a seat wherever it happened to be in that aircraft. Then would I still have lived? Or would the person who had that single seat live? Or would we had all died? Well, I just don't know. And it's something that, uh, I don't know, I think about it every day and I ponder it and I have no answer to it. But anyway, when I got on the plane, the plane taxied over to get ready for takeoff. There was a lady across the aisle from me, a Mrs. Silberman, and I tapped her on her arm and she, I told her it was a pretty view of the Washington Monument. <clears throat> if she'd like to see it. So she got down and looked out of my window and she said, it is a pretty view. I here just a few weeks back spoke to her daughter and uh, who has still has a, a tough time uh, accepting that she lost her mother and dad that night. And uh, anyway, we took off, went up into the clouds. We were in the clouds and no smoking sign and uh, seat, fast seat belt signs were still on. But not too long after we left, the no smoking sign went off. And at that time I smoked like a freight train. <laughs> In fact, I told somebody here just recently uh, at a church group, I think I see you way around here somewhere, but at a Methodist church I was speaking, I said, I've never tasted beer, whiskey, wine in my life, and I quit smoking almost 40 years ago. I said, I've gotten so good I can't stand myself. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> we were in the clouds, and it was a little bumpy, not bad. I'd flown that route many times before, and... Uh, I saw the wings, uh, the right wing, the side I was on, there was a beam of light coming up through the clouds in the fog. And I knew that Kroger had opened up a new store in Barracks Road Shopping Center over here in Charlottesville. And they had employed the uh, company that uses those searchlights uh, to advertise their store. And I can remember those searchlights because I was in the Normandy invasion and I remember uh, one of the 11 trips we took from Southampton, England over to Omaha and Utah beaches. The first trip we took were a load of 60 inch searchlights. They were carbon operated, 90 millimeter guns and the ammo for those 90 millimeter guns <clears throat> and the man that manned them. And so I know what those searchlights and those beams looked like because they were up on top of Omaha beach the next night. And so, that light was there. In fact, it hit underneath the ring the second time. And then I couldn't quite figure out why it was taking so long to get to Charlottesville. Because I'd flown a route, a route, as I've said before, and couldn't understand why we weren't already on the ground. But the plane did take some various and sundry turns. And then it seemed to me that, we, that everything was okay. They got in straight and level flight, I assume, because we were in fog and rain and stuff, and I didn't know. But my little light above me was not working, and I had the book of exits I'd purchased in Chicago under my left leg. And I'd only read 13 pages, and I'm not superstitious. I'm glad, I reckon. But uh, everything was going along fine, and you could feel the wheels. He extended the wheels and, and like, getting ready to land. Somebody in the middle of the plane on the left-hand side, I assumed, had just told a punchline to a joke, and they were all laughing when that plane hit 
terrific noise and everything. But thank God, there was no screaming, no hollering, nothing. Everything was quiet. But I had the most beautiful vision of Jesus Christ at the right at the moment of impact, standing about three to four feet off the ground with his arms up pointing to heaven, had on a long robe, no shoes, long beard and hair, and he looked at me just like I'm looking at any of you folks, and he said to me, be concerned not, I'll be with you always. Now I said I would tell you another story about <clears throat> Mike Marshall's friend, uh, Phil James, the very religious person, and his wife. Just week last week he called me, he was telling me that a, a thought his wife had had, and I've pondered it quite a bit, and I think maybe we could all agree. What she thought is the moment I saw that vision of Christ, those people on that plane also saw that uh, that vision themselves when they met their their end of life right there. Because I think he was there for those people. He took them with him when he left. That's the way I've always believed. It took about five to ten minutes to really figure out what happened after that. And I felt myself internal injuries and lacerations, what little I knew about it. And I knew my hip was something wrong with that. I didn't know what, but something wrong with it. <clears throat> but I thought to myself, I'll be able to get up and walk away from here. I took the seat belt to loose and started to get up, and that's when the first pain hit. And I tell you, that's smarts. And I used the seat cushion for a pillow in the back of the seat to keep my face warm, because I understand it was around 38 to 40 degree temperature that night, and mist and rain and so forth. And I could hear wild cats hollering and animals walking around in the woods and so forth. But the next morning when it got daylight, <clears throat> uh, there was a big bear and a little bear about 30, 40 feet away. And I thought, golly Moses, I don't need any more problems. <laughs> so, anyway, the big bear stood on her hind legs at, I'd say, six or seven feet in height. And the little one must have been her cub running all around. I thought, keep going, you fuzzy rascals will come up here. And anyway, she came down and they wandered on off. And that was it. And the fog lifted around 11 that morning and got just pretty as it could be. And I could see planes flying all over and everything. And uh, But because of the color in the mountains, we were camouflaged, no doubt. And we couldn't, they couldn't see. So I knew when the fog came back in, around two that afternoon, Saturday afternoon, I knew I was going to be there another night at least. So I did find a coat that was over close to me and I was able to pull it over me with a stick. And it's just a matter of trying to make yourself comfortable. I could hear people hollering, the neighbors down in the community. I didn't know where we were. And I always said I heard, when I saw Christ, I heard the wings hitting trees. If it had been for Christ with that vision from the illumination of that robe illuminating that mountain and seeing the trees, we could have been hitting buildings. I have no way of knowing. But anyway, that was what happened. And so Saturday night, it was just, again, uh, wildcats and animals and so forth. And then Sunday morning, it was right warm Sunday morning, and then a buzzard flew in and went all around the area, the perimeter of the accident, and left. And he would go about 45 minutes, I assume, and I reckon he went to tell his buddy, he said, man, we, we, we can go to town here. <laughs> but I would reckon maybe 60 or 70 buzzards came back in and landed on limbs all in those trees all around. And I learned from that experience that you cannot outstare a buzzard. They just keep that old head looking right at you, and you, <laughs> you can't win. And I talked to a vet one time, and he said, well, they kind of have a leader. That must have been the one that came in first and said that that one will watch you and if he figures that at any point in time you get in a situation where you will not be able to retaliate effectively, then he will leave his perch after you and the rest will follow. And that's what those long beaks are. Get your eyes. I said, man, I'm glad I didn't know that then. Think about it. Look at that rascal. But then Sunday morning, Later after that, I'd say two or three hours after that, I for some reason felt that if any rescue people came, they would come up the mountain. But I started hearing a fellow talk to somebody else if he saw anything yet, and the fellow would haul back. No, he didn't. 
And so a few minutes later, I thought, well, that's above me. Then I just started uh, waiting, and so it, then it started getting closer, and I thought I could hear them thrashing in the, in the woods. And then the fellow would holler again, do you see anything yet? And the fellow holler, no. And then I knew they could hear my voice, so I started hollering, oh, here's the plane crash. So it wasn't but just a few minutes, an Air Force paramedic showed up, Sergeant Weiss, and his uh, cohort, uh, Corporal Harris. And they came up to me, and I shook hands with him. I said, where the heck you guys been? He said, we've been looking. I said, well, I'm glad you found me. But I said, go check to see if anybody else is alive. I haven't seen a soul of anybody. I mean, I haven't seen, a, I haven't heard of any noise or anything from anybody. They weren't gone but about five or 10 minutes. They came back and I asked them if there's anybody alive and they said they didn't know yet. But it, one thing I've never really understand, you left for all that time with no, no life or no nothing. And then when the accident, the, the, when that, those soldiers came, it wasn't 15 minutes after that that a whole mountain was full of people. I often wonder how they got there so fast. <clears throat> but uh, there were doctors and, and the state police and sheriff's department people and all of those around. And uh, the doctor asked me, I remember, he said, uh, what's, what, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. I think I said, my hips, I know my hips bad shape and something wrong with my right knee and foot. I don't know. And he checked me over and said, yeah, you're pretty close. So I said, close to what? And uh, anyway, he checked me all over at everything and other people all around. And then he, I asked him, I said, how do y'all plan to get me out of here? He said, we're going to let the helicopter come up, you know, and drop the cable down, put me in a basket and, you know, winch me up to the helicopter. I said, oh, no. <laughs> that wind was blowing pretty hard up there that morning. And I figured it'd get me hung in those leaves and stuff and drop me again. And one drop's enough, but two like that's too much. And he said, well, the only other way we could get you out would be to carry you up on top of the mountain. I said, well, that's fine, except you'll have to give me some morphine or something before you move me. I said, that, he said, yeah, we'll do that. So he gave me a shot, waited a while and gave him another shot. I think about 20, 30 minutes after that, I could have gotten out of there by myself. <laughs> so anyway, the, the, the people with the rescue squads and, and uh, you know, all the rescue people and searchers and so forth. What a wonderful job they did carrying me out of there. They put me in that wire basket, took me right up on top where the helicopter was, and I just as smooth as silk where I go right up there. Man, I couldn't walk it like that in my life. It was just smooth as silk. <laughs> and we got up to the helicopter. It was a big old Marine helicopter from Camp Lejeune, I think. And the pilot was hanging, had his head hanging out the door. I asked him if he was a pilot. He said, yeah. I said, he said, why? I said, well, I think I've made it out of that one down over the hill. If you let this drop, I don't think I can make two in a row. He said, oh, we'd be all right. So anyway, they put me in the helicopter and he took off and he flew me to Scott Stadium, uh, doctor, and uh, landed at Scott Stadium and he put me in an ambulance and, and he was really flying. I think Richard Petty was driving that thing. <laughs> he was just flat flying. I said, my Lord, man, I've been on a mountain two days. There's no hurry to get to the hospital. <laughs> so he slowed down <laughs> and went on into the hospital. And that's when I had my first encounter with Dr. Frank McHugh here, standing there. And he said, he probably thought, what's this old buzzer doing here? Just, anyway, but he took excellent care of me uh, they reduced my hip and took, you know, all the things that needed to be done. Of course, I didn't know. But I got to watch the Redskins and the Steelers that afternoon on, on the football game. So that's pretty much my story. It's, the, it's one I've told thousands of times over the years, and I, I like to tell it. I like to maybe think that it does help some people, and particularly... Uh, people who lost loved ones in the accident. I know how you feel because here in the last few years I've been feeling a, a more of a spiritual attachment to all of those good people. And uh, I feel closer to them as I get older. Now there must be a reason for that. I can't explain it. I don't know. But if any of, of you people who lost relatives uh, in the accident, if you have any questions that I can help you with, I'd be certainly glad to do so. Yes, ma'am.
Um, I would just like to introduce you to someone to maybe add to your story, speaking of that connection. Um, my son, David Reed McCurry, is the grandson of David Wood Finley. He okay. was born on October 30th. Oh, the day of that. 26 years after the accident, 26 souls, at 8.44 in the evening. Missed it four minutes. That's fantastic. Congratulations, son. That's fantastic. Connection. I think so. That's wonderful. Yeah, 26 years after, and 26 people had passed away that night, and 8:44, and it was really 8:40. But you're close enough. He's always been relaxed. My my watch could have been wrong too. Yeah. Anybody else? If not, I want to thank all of you good people who've been here this morning and helped us with this ceremony. We've enjoyed putting it on, and we are planning other things down the road, hopefully. I would like to see a <coughs> nice, high, tall cross erected right at the crash site is what I hope to do down the road if I live long enough, and good Lord willing. But thank you very much, and thank you for coming. And thank all of you good people.